Hello and welcome to our bookshop in Tring. I'm Ben Morehouse. So uh, we've got a series of uh, interviews with uh, with poets uh, from the UK, and uh, this is our first one uh, with Dean Atter, and uh, he um, published The Black Flamingo. Um, it came out last year in hardback, this year in paperback. It's a very challenging piece, and uh, and it's been highly praised by so many different publications and other authors. And I do uh, really recommend it. Uh, he's in conversation with Nadine Aisha Jassat. Thanks, Ben. I'm Nadine Aisha Jassat, and I'm so delighted to be here to chat to Dean Atta for National Poetry Day. Dean is the author of The Black Flamingo, which is a wonderful and deeply moving read following the journey of Michael. Dean, welcome. Hello, thank you. Oh, great to be here. It's so lovely to have you here, which I recognise is also our respective flats, but it's, it's so lovely to have you in this digital space. Definitely. I know today we're going to be talking a wee bit about poetry and hope. And so just to open the conversation, I was wondering if I could ask what relationship or connection poetry and hope have for you? I think I find a lot of hope in reading poetry by people who have either been through things that I have also been through and come out the other side. Maybe their poetry gives advice. Maybe their poetry shines a light on an experience that I recognise from my own life. And I think as a writer, that's what I try and achieve as well. You know, shining a light on experiences that maybe aren't always talked about openly. Um, whether that's to do with mental health, whether that's to do with race and racism or sexuality and, um, you know, being able to be somewhat of, yeah, a shining light that kind of makes people know that, you know, you may go through challenges, you may face um, obstacles, but, you know, it's not the words that get you through necessarily, but they are a way of recording what you've been through. And I think there's a real um, power in that you know, archiving, recording and, um, you know, being able to reflect and look back and think, wow, I got through that time. And like a hundred percent. And I think, you know, listening to you speak, it makes me think about how for me, storytelling in itself is an act of resilience and truth telling, especially when there's a wider context of, of silencing. And it feels like the Black Flamingo is a volume that tells so much truth and tells it so well and tells it so beautifully. When you were writing it, what were some of your hopes for the book? What were some of the hopes that were the heart of it for you? I think I really hope that young um, black and queer kids would read the book and see themselves, would see a character get a happy ending and um, be supported on a journey that isn't always easy, but um, he's never left alone to figure things out. He's always got a friend or a family member or a teacher or someone that's helping him along the way. Um, I know not everyone in real life is lucky enough to have those people, but I think showing a character be supported and loved, I think is really important to show the possibility of that because I think a lot of people assume maybe when you come out as gay that everyone's gonna reject you or something like that. And I wanted to show at least um, one story where that doesn't happen and so you know I opened the book by saying this book is a fairy tale because really this is me writing the fairy tale version of what I would have loved my teenage um, life to be like you know he, he really is loved and supported and I wanted to show that is a possibility um, and it's not always um, rejection and tragedy. <laughs> But it feels like, I feel like the book feels like a bit of a gift in exactly the way you describe it. You know, it feels, you mentioned that word sort of alone there. And I feel like The Black Flamingo is a book, like for many different reasons that many kids, including I think myself coming from like a mixed heritage perspective, looking at Michael's experience. It's one of those books that feels like if I'd read it when I was a kid, I would have felt less alone. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and I think well, what I was hoping for was that like, you know, there's an image in the book of the black flamingo on a salt mm -hmm. lake and it's in amongst all the pink flamingos and there's just the one black flamingo, but he stands out, but he's not alone. You know, he's there yeah. with all the other flamingos and you don't have to be um, the same as everyone else to be with everyone else. You know, you can stand with people that you are completely different from, you know, and, you know, skin colour is just one small difference, really, when you think about it. And so I wanted to, yeah, show that 
being different, being unique doesn't mean you have to be alone, but maybe sometimes you are, maybe sometimes you stand out because you're the one on stage and you're in the spotlight, but then are you alone? No, everyone's looking at you. So, you know, you've got everyone's attention. So isn't that a brilliant thing? You can do something amazing with that attention being in the spotlight. So I think, you know, I wanted to flip that on its head, you know, standing out doesn't necessarily mean you're alone or lonely. It might mean you're actually in a really powerful position. Yeah. Yeah. And a, a powerful position as well to sort of claiming all of who you are and saying all of you who you are. And I think for me, this journey that Michael has in the Black Flamingo of becoming to me was a really powerful one. And I guess thinking on our theme of hope, what role do you think hope plays in becoming in whatever way that journey might mean for you? Um, I think it's it's a double edged sword, I think, you know, in terms of hope and becoming because you can hope for a lot of things, but there's also um, a need to have acceptance of what is, you know, and also um, what comes to pass, because you can hope to get something, achieve something, you know, become something. But if you don't, I think there's also a strength in looking back at the journey and seeing, okay, what do I, what did I learn? What have I become? And how can I celebrate what has come to pass? Because, you know, even if you're striving towards something that you didn't get, you still got somewhere and thinking about that. So I think, you know, we don't find all the answers and we don't come, um, you know, at the end of this book, Michael, um, the character isn't, you know, the finished version, version of himself. He actually still has a long way to go. He's only 19 at the end of the book. So he knows, and I think the reader knows that there's going to be many more obstacles and many more changes for Michael. And I think that's it. That's why I write for teenagers because there's so much possibility in being a teenager. You know, you, you see the world in a hopeful way. Sometimes mm -hmm. that causes, you know, a lot of anger and frustration because you don't see adults seeing the world the same way. They don't see the possibility for change as young people see it. And so, um, you know, there's a struggle between, you know, hope and also kind of being realistic. Um, but I love that teenagers and, you know, a lot of people I don't accept being realistic because actually that's quite defeatist. And I think sometimes we can hope for more. And, you know, we're, even if we don't get exactly what we want, we're going to get something. And so that's kind of what I'm kind of going for with this story and, and my writing in general. It's like mm -hmm. not being hopeful to the kind of, to, to there's only one outcome that you'll accept because you have to accept whatever the outcome is, even if it's not a desirable one, but you can work from that place and think, okay, this is where we're at. Where do we go from here? Yeah. And I feel like that's such like a wise lesson for life, actually, that because the thing is, none of us, none of us know what is around the corner. None of us, especially I think 2020 has shown that. And I think for me, something that I've always tried to, to keep to navigate me through any waters um, is that like connection to self and like knowledge of, of self. And like as long as you're being true to you and, and connected to you, you can kind of navigate some of the really tricky stuff that's thrown at you does that mean you know who you are because i don't know who i am <laughs> <laughs> on any given day dean <laughs> on any given day even even just a commitment to trying to honor that even if you don't know because you're never gonna always be the same person right mm. like what like you say we're always changing every day yeah. but i think a commitment to trying to be true to yourself because often and you know we see michael face this as well often other people's judgments other people's voices can can make us feel boxed in and, and like we can't um and i think what i love about him as a character is that you know or even as a book more generally is that it shows this but it shows how he moves through it um yeah no i really loved him in terms of like you say so michael we sort of finished the book and he's 19 but when we start the book he's six right he's yeah so for you as a writer what was some of your process in sort of taking your character's voice and growth through 13 years you know what was that like it was super fun because it was like i was writing multiple books because i was writing a character at different ages and so michael at six years old he wants a barbie doll he wonders you know why his dad isn't around he has you know a very kind of limited um view and understanding of the world and um and that because he's he's young and he's had a, a little bit of experience 
But then as he gets older, you know, his, his view expands. So he notices more things going on in his family. Um, he notices, um, you know, some of his friends are wealthier than other friends, you know. So one of his friends, when they're going off to secondary school, one of his friends is going to go to a private school, but the other friend could never, you know, afford that. And he might be able to go if he gets a scholarship. Like, and so, you know, he's noticing inequality in the world already at, you know, 11. Um, and then by the time he gets to university, you know, he's faced a lot of things. He's come out, you know, mm -hmm. he's um, been stopped by the police with his uncle in an incident that really sh kind of shakes them up a bit. And, um, you know, he's discovered this love of drag and also he's done his own research into like black queer role models and kind of seen the history and legacy of the kind of the LGBT movement and black people in particular within that. And it's just blown his mind. So, you know, by the end of the book, Michael has gone from a little boy that wants a Barbie doll um, to you know, a young man who wants to take over the world, I think, <laughs> with high heels on. Um, so it, a, a lot happens, you know, and I think the way I saw the arc of it was that he actually becomes the Barbie doll, um, you know, by the end. He gets to dress up, put the heels on, put the makeup on and be this kind of desirable, empowered kind of um, figure of femininity, even though, you know, he's he doesn't have any kind of gender dysphoria or anything like that but he knows that you know being a boy and being a man doesn't need to be limited to being a certain way and so I think he really embraces femininity in costume and makeup but also you know feels empowered you know by the amazing role model he's had of his mother and other um figures from from history as well that he kind of like refers to in that final performance so I think yeah, the journey was one of kind of expanding his worldview, expanding his vocabulary, and, um, you know, in doing so, hopefully doing that for the reader as well. And, but like, honestly, I think it does that and more for the reader, to be honest. I think it's, it's one of those few books where reading it, I feel like I'm in the company of a friend, you know, I, I don't know how to describe it, but I think that there's some of those books where the character feels so present to you you know, and you, you feel that real, like, love for them. Yeah. Um, and certainly, exactly like you say, you know, there's so much in the book in terms of the challenges that Michael faces, and yet coming through through them or moving through them and, and being himself and having this journey is in itself, I guess, quite a, a hopeful thing. And I guess I'm wondering for our listeners, uh, viewers, listeners, readers today, what tips you would give for what role hope can play or for staying hopeful in times when things don't feel so easy to access that hope? Um, oh, great question. Um, I think if you're lucky enough to have young people in your life, definitely spending time with them. For me, my two nieces, um, the immediacy and the presence, you know, um, they're always in the present moment. It's always about the current thing, whatever they want to play with, whatever they want to do. Um, they're, they're kind of keep me in the present moment and I don't necessarily have to worry so much about um, my work and my deadlines and and the world at large and what's going on but obviously not everyone's got that um so i think reading is a great escape you know because i think it you get absorbed into another world and um, you get to have new experiences maybe reading stuff far from your own experience to kind of just broaden your perspective on the world um reading poetry for me, it's good because it's short and snappy. And, um, you know, if you've got time commitments, um, kind of dipping into a poetry collection or a novel in verse, something that's kind of got short, um, punchy chapters or sections is really good. So I'd say, you know, any of our books, the, the kind of three people here today, I think would be, and your own, the four of us, <laughs> um, I think would be a good start. Um, and then, yeah, I think hope, finding hope, yeah, like you said, it's, it is also about, you know, looking within, like, what is it that will, um, what do you want? You know, whether it's for today or for tomorrow, like, and kind of just kind of small goals, small achievable goals. I think that helps the bigger things, um, you know, feel a bit less, um, you know, in the, in the present, if you can focus on, okay, maybe today I'm going to read, you know, one chapter of a book, or I'm going to write um, a poem, a free write for five minutes about my feelings and kind of just let it out. And um, I think kind of daily practices really help me. So, you know, outside of reading and writing, 
I do uh, meditation every day for 10 minutes and I also, and I use Headspace, the app for that. So that's really accessible. And I also use Duolingo to practice my Greek because I think, you know, learning something is always fun because um, it gives you, you know, just a small sense of achievement. And like, I like this kind of gamified learning that apps can give you because like you get that star or that, you know, whatever to show you, you've passed that day's task and you're like, yay, I don't need to do anything else today because I've done, 10 minutes of Greek or 10 minutes of meditation it sounds silly but actually for me those have been things that have, I've only you know the only things I've managed to constantly do through um, lockdown and everything was you know do my meditation and do my Greek and sometimes I'm like all right I'll call it quits and go back to bed now because that's it um, and I think being okay with um, not getting tons done because this is a time when you know it's getting up and, and kind of facing stuff is hard enough. Like, and having to do loads of huge tasks is probably a big ask for anyone, whatever position you're in in life right now. So giving yourself small achievable goals, you know, I think that, that's the thing. Yeah, I feel like that sort of self-compassion and heaven in that is so, so beautiful. Um, and my last quick question for you, and it's a question that I'm going to ask to all of our panellists, um, is one of the most famous quotes about hope is the Emily Dickinson poem, where hope is a thing with feathers. And I was wondering if hope was a thing for you, um, or indeed you can even answer for Michael, because <laughs> I know feathers play a role in here. Um, yeah. But if hope was a thing for you, what, what it would be? Hope is a black flamingo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's perfect. <laughs> Thanks so much, Dean. Honestly, it's been a pleasure to talk to you and get some insight into you as a writer, but also to the black flamingo. And I really, really hope that people listening today pick up a copy of this because it's just a treasure. It's honestly a, a treasure for your bookshelf. So thank, thank you. you. I am the black flamingo. The black flamingo is me trying to find myself. This book is a fairy tale in which I am the prince and the princess. I am the king and the queen. I am my own wicked witch and fairy godmother. This book is a fairy tale in which I'm cursed and blessed by others. But finally, I am the fairy finding my own magic. And this moment in The Black Flamingo is when Michael sees The Black Flamingo for the first time. Grandad goes back inside. He draws my attention to the news. The story, a black flamingo has landed on the island. An expert on screen explaining it is the opposite of an albino. Too much melanin, he says. Camera pans the salt lake full of pink but my eye is drawn to that one black body in the flamboyance. The following evening, my beach towel and shorts dry on the balcony. Couples on mopeds ride past the house. Dogs walk humans before dinner. Grandad coughs violently, then lights another cigarette. Grandma calls us in to eat. The black flamingo is on the news again. I pick the dining chair facing the TV. Grandad asks, why does it matter? if he's black, adding, the other flamingos don't care. And I am certain what he's saying is I love you. <laughs>